since there will be water, but it has a different name. It's from the Word of God in the Bible you can see. Thank you for coming to the class. You, you could have gone to Starbucks and wait a while, but you didn't. And uh, thank you for that. You may have been tempted to do that, but be careful little feet where you go. So we're, we're, we're a better place. And uh, we're going to be studying something that we're probably pretty familiar with. I don't know when you obeyed the gospel, but I obeyed the gospel at a young age. When I talk about obey the gospel, just terminology like that uh, has, a, has a meaning, doesn't it? A lot of people might not understand what we mean obey the gospel. But there's a relationship we have with God. The gospel we hear produces the faith, and then we respond, confessing who Jesus is, turning away from our sins, because we know the nature of the gospel message to save us from our sins. And then we're baptized, obedience to the gospel. And we're going to look at various, various facets of that. We'll deal with uh, a couple of arguments that are used to show that uh, what you thought about Acts 2.38 and, and those passages are not true, but we're going to find where they miss it and establish the, the truth. And there's, I mean, we've, we've kind of hit this from different angles, but there's no doubt about it that, as Peter says, baptism saves us. And we've got to understand what that means. It didn't mean we earned it. It didn't mean that something's magical in the water uh, or anything like that. But they have a context, those passages, and we will, we will talk about them. Apostle Paul, who wrote the book of Romans, talking about grace and faith and, and the things of God's sovereignty in the book of Romans, he writes that. But you notice in Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, the first paragraph we have here, if you don't uh, have your, your Bibles open to that. And Ananias told him, why tarriest thou and arise and be baptized? And what's connected with that? Be baptized and what? Wash away my sins. Uh, how can I wash away my sins? Well, God sprinkles our heart with the blood of Christ when we're baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. And it's what he does when we obey the gospel. Now, I ask the question here of uh, when you say, so why, why was that so urgent? And why would you tarry? Because that's something that is, it, well, I'm going to find essential to do, but it's very important to do just here. Why tarry thou? This is something you've got to do. Well, I, I, I've been on the road to Damascus, you know, and, uh, and uh, I've, I've been fasting all these days. And, uh, and now you're telling me to, to be baptized? Yeah. Why are you tarrying? Now, we don't read that in Acts 9, 18. We read in Acts 22. But what's even important about that? When he goes back over his conversion, goes back over his life, what does he bring up? He fills in some details for us because that was an event that was very important in his relationship to, to the Lord. Rise and be baptized. He just says he was baptized in Acts 9. But rise and be baptized is what we see in Acts twenty two sixteen 16, because we know washing away sins is connected with that. Now, if I were to ask, is it essential that your sins be washed away to be saved? I think, I don't care what background we have and denominational world, we'd all agree, wouldn't we? You can't be saved. And if we don't have our sins washed away, if we don't have the forgiveness of sins, that's the problem. That's why Jesus died. That's why he became, uh, took on flesh and blood so he could die. So the whole gospel message that we obey, we respond to, is understanding that this is what uh, it indeed is connected with. Baptism in Acts 2, 38 is baptism in the name of the Lord. What does the name of the Lord mean to you? He said, what, what does that mean? I just said Jesus. In the name of the Lord, Jesus. It's authority. That's right. Now, we may say, say something, we baptize them, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and it's scriptural. But it's not a magical formula that we have. It's a concept, and you have it, in the name of the law, I'm knocking on your door. Well, who's knocking on my door? Well, my name's Jim, but I am the name of the law. I have the authority of the law behind me. His authority of God behind him. And the salvation is from Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. And therefore, he has a name. 
Now, look at these two passages, the first paragraph. How did Jesus and when did Jesus receive this name by which he could save us? I guess I think that's an appropriate way of asking the question. When he was eight days old, he was named Jesus. What does Jesus mean? Savior. Jehovah saves. He's, that, that, that happened eight days old. No, the name that saves us is not J-E-S-U-S -S or Jeshua. But what do we see here? Read with me in Philippians 2, 8 and 9. Being found in fashion as a man. See, he came as a man. He humbled himself, becoming obedient even unto death. Yea, the horrible thing. Yea, the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name. Verse 10 recognizes your point, David, the authority that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of the things in heaven and things on the earth and things under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is what? He has authority over my life. He's my Lord. He's Savior. Here he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. Got God's glory behind it. Jesus did accomplish his will to save us from our sins. So when was he given the name that saves? Not when he was named Jesus and he was circumcised. But that's a name. <laughs> yes. But the name, the authority, he had to die and he had to be what? resurrected to get the name. And so when Peter in Acts 4 in verse 12, when he is talking about he's doing miracles, we talked about that yesterday to confirm the, the word of God. And he had healed a man has been he's from mother's womb. And he was saying it's the power of God behind this. And then he says, and in none other is there salvation for neither is there any other name under heaven. Well, that's that's where our existence under heaven that is given among men wherein we might be saved. We may be saved. We should be saved or what? We must be saved. We must be saved. There's no other name. And so when we read repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, and the authority of the Lord. We know what the, he died. It was resurrected. That's exactly what they could do out of knowledge because he just preached to them Jesus's death and resurrection. So what's that? Oh, I just don't know what that means. No, I just, I just preached to you. And you crucified him. There's the guilt of sin. Now I need to be baptized along with repentance into the name or in the name of the of the Lord. And so we see now baptism becomes, I hope, if you don't know if it's essential by now, you're, you're going to have to lean that way because there's no other name given wherein we must be saved. And that's why we see that phrase connected with it. It's not magical. It's not a magical formula. It's a concept. He has the authority to save because he was died and he was resurrected. That's why 1 Peter 3, 21, we have a clean conscience, answer of a good conscience because Jesus was raised from the dead. He had the name and there, it didn't say anything about his death. He had to die first before he could be resurrected. So all these things harmonize together. So we're speaking about baptism and notice it's just our English word is just a transliteration. You have the Greek word baptisma and the verb is bapto, ba bapto the idea of to, to dip is what it, it meant. So we ask the question, what, what does that mean? And I just asked the question of uh, sometimes we, we come across people, they were they were baptized as babies, infants. And that's a practice of Catholic Church and denominations. And how do they baptize them? They sprinkle, don't they? Well, that's just a form. That's just a form of baptism. Well, that's what man has done. Do you know why sprinkling for baptism came into being in man's history? We can know from the 12th and 13th century, hospitals, 
Here's where 1230 said the Catholic Church has power over governments and they're, they're involved in and in kind of ruling the, the world. There you had the government along with the, the, the idea of Christianity, the Catholic Church. Well, people were too sick to be immersed. And so the Catholic Church, same idea, will, will sprinkle for baptism. And that's just common now. And now denominations, certain denominations, they'll, they'll sprinkle for baptism. But what does the word mean? It means, and here, uh, you could be dyeing a garment. How do you dye a garment? You dip the garment in the, the, purple, the purple dye. Uh, Lexus on page 67, history of that word. It's the drawing of wine by dipping the cup into the bowl. Plato metaphorically said, being overwhelmed with questions. So you had, a, you had that concept because I, you, you, you covered me up with questions. That's what it means. That's, that's the, how the word was used. And that's what it, it indicated. They both came up out of the water. Matthew 3, 16, when Jesus came up out of the water, he was baptized by John. Why did he come up out of the water? We just have to sprinkle water on him. Now in my picture, have you seen pictures like this where he was sprinkling water on him? For baptism? I didn't use that one. I think, hey, he's, I think he's already been immersed. He's come back up. And but that's what the word means. So why do we change that? It's, it's because they were too sick. My heart breaks because I, we, I, had a, I was studying with a man in Deer Park. He was, he's a, he was a teenager. And I'm not, I, I grew up with polio around and we, we took a little medicine. But he had polio and he was in an iron lung. And he's in a nursing home. And got in touch with people, I think from, from Baytown, but he was over here and I started studying with him. You had to study, he had to look in a mirror and we had to transfer things. And, but we studied and studied and studied with him. And he was very afraid to be out of that iron lung. And the authorities, uh, we got time where he, he realized he needed to be baptized. And authorities said, and I, I tried to tell him, but when they, they clean this, they take you out. And they had a, they had a facility there where we, we could baptize him and put him back in there. But he was so afraid, he, he refused to be baptized and he died. And that was a hard funeral to preach. And you think, well, what's gonna God, God gonna do with that fellow? But I can understand the Catholic Church, you should have sprinkled him. He could, he could handle that. His head sticking out. You could have sprinkled him. Why aren't you, why aren't you a man of God? It's because I know what, what is demanded of God. And it could have been done. They take him out. He has a few minutes before he panics. And that could have been done. And he knew that. But he didn't want to, to go through that. So I understand how it came about. I can understand the feelings about that. But that still doesn't change what God commanded to do. And let's just talk about the word sprinkle. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. Turn with me to Hebrews 12 and verse 24. I don't have this in your text, but I have the, the word is a different word. Sprinkling is rontizo. And we have the form of that word of, in the verb verb form in Hebrews 12 24 and it gets real close to this idea of the gospel a covenant a promise made by God and and addressing it to the Old Testament practices where the, the book of the covenant was sprinkled he says Jesus is now the mediator uh, he, he, he's of spirits of just men made perfect we've we've come to the church and this is the context said people who are members are enrolled in heaven and we've come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling. He didn't say the water of sprinkling. <laughs> he said the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better than that of Abel. Abel shed his blood, first one murdered and all those sorts of things. He was, his, he was righteous. So it's the righteousness of his blood because of that. But the, the covenant was sprinkled with blood to ratify it. Well, he's a mediator of which covenant? A, well, he's a, he's a meter of a new covenant. It's not the old covenant redone. 
It's a new covenant based upon better promises and, and the conditions are you're going to be, be baptized. But the blood was dedicating that gospel. And so it's, it's kind of connected with the new covenant. Now look with me in 1 Peter 1 and verse 2. Peter is writing, addressing Christians. A lot of them would have a, a Jewish background. And he opens his book with verse 2. When he says, it's according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, there's the Spirit's gospel that sets us apart from a world of sin, there's your gospel, unto obedience, I mentioned earlier, obeying the gospel, unto obedience, and what's connected with it? Sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. What's sprinkled? Not water, but when we obey the gospel and we are immersed in water, what does God do from heaven? He sprinkles, applies the blood of Jesus to our hearts because we have a guilty conscience and he cleanses our conscience, the deepest part of us of judging ourselves. We were clean of, of all, all that guilt. Well, he used the word sprinkle there. But it's not, it's not baptism, but it's what God does when our bodies are washed with clean water, pure water. We are, we are sanctified by the blood of Christ. So when we read Romans 6, 3, and 4, are you ignorant that all we were baptized, we're baptized into his what? His death. The benefits of his death. Our hearts are sprinkled clean by the blood of Christ. So there's not blood in the water or anything like that, but it's, it's, the, it's the connection of his death based upon his resurrection that we have those forgiveness of sins. Any, any questions on uh, this idea of what baptism is, dipping, immersion, overwhelming one in something? So when we speak about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what are we talking about? They were immersed with the power of the Holy Spirit to speak in tongues and do miraculous things. Still, baptism always means the same thing of being dipped, immersed, and the idea of baptism, being buried. They don't sprinkle a little dirt over you. You're buried. So all those uh, points point down to the fact that it is, it is indeed immersion. So that's what, that's what God demands of us. Now look at uh, on the page four, question number two. In passages that both have baptism and salvation or its equivalent, like maybe remission of sins, salvation, when, when they are brought together, does baptism come before or does it occur after salvation? You ever thought about that? Our Baptist friends will say it comes where? Where does baptism come? Before salvation or after? After. You're saved when you believe, and, and then you, you believe, and you're saved, and then you're baptized. Well, what order does Jesus give in Mark 16, 16? Notice the point is made in verse 15. You go and preach the gospel to all creation. He that believeth believes what? The gospel message. He that believeth and then is baptized shall be saved. It didn't say he that believeth is saved and shall be baptized. Just taking the word as it is and then realize that if I mess up there, I am going to contradict a lot of things that I'm reading in my Bible. And I would say, I need to back up on that. Because here are things, and I'll see in the book of Acts, where we, we, we look at uh, the consequences of being saved, and it always happens after baptism joy, rejoicing. But that's the, that's the order that we, we have things in. So Acts 2.38, 2, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. I'm looking toward, looking toward the remission of my sins. That's future. I haven't had them yet, and then I get baptized. It's always pointing toward something. So in Acts 8 and verse 38 uh, 
38 following, and, and uh, he speaks, we'll start back with 35 of preaching Jesus. We'll find that here is water, what hindered me to be baptized. So he heard the gospel message. When you preach Jesus, baptism is going to be connected with that. Why? Because it's something you do later. Oh, it's essential to salvation. You're preaching Jesus, his death and resurrection. And understand this. So what hath hindered me to be baptized? The question is, how did he ever know about baptism? Because he had Jesus preached to him. Like in Acts 2, they knew his death and resurrection. They knew the basis of their, of their salvation. And so what did he do? I believe, because he said, if you believe us, thou mayest. So that was one thing. And so he made that confession. Jesus is the Christ. He spoke with God, has that confession that Jesus is the Christ. He's the Son of God. And they both went down the water. He baptized him, came up out of the water. And it's then when he goes on his way rejoicing. He goes on his way rejoicing. We'll talk more ab about that in Acts 16. And I, and I think that we should do that too because there's the rejoicing. But uh, turn with me to Acts, Acts 16 because it puts together uh, things that are, I think, important to understand with this idea. Because it says here, it's after baptism that he rejoiced having believed. And that becomes, uh, I think, a great point to consider. So let's put it all together. It's just a few verses. When the jailer is asked the question, you know, what, what must I do to be saved? And that was more than just, I spared, you spared, help me spare my life because I was going to kill myself. He wasn't thinking about physical life. He's thinking about, this must be from God. He's been hearing them sing hymns and praise unto, unto God. And they're, they've been preaching the gospel. And he kind of puts those things uh, together. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And said, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved. All right, we just stopped there, but it doesn't. So he said, well, what, my question, well, how would they believe on the Lord? Well, how would they believe? Hearing the gospel, isn't it? He didn't have a religious experience because the earthquake, day, and, he, and God saved him, and I'm, I must be saved. It wasn't an experience like that. It's, it's going to be based upon the knowledge of Jesus' death and resurrection. So what does he do? They speak the word of the Lord unto him with all that is in his house. They had to hear the gospel. And when you read your Bibles and, and men and, and the dominational, uh, you know, their schools, they know this. And some are honest to admit it. They have to admit that there's never anyone saved apart from the word. No one. And you begin to question, well, I thought God gave me faith. You always say it's up to something I did. It God's, God's sovereignty, you were going to be saved and he gave you faith. But it always is connected with the word of God. And they will admit that. They have to, because that's the truth. My question is, why is that? What does this say? <laughs> Till you preach the word to me, not let me have an experience and a miracle happen to me. And, and I was, uh, had my heart enlightened some mysterious way. I have to have that word preached to me. And he always used man to preach to man. And he had to confirm man, have the power, had the God's message. It wasn't just for man. That's why they, they had the miracle pow miraculous powers upon them. But you never have anybody saved apart from the word. So the gospel had to be, so they had to believe. Now we, we continue. When he did that, so he, in that same hour of the night, he washed their stripes. I think that's an indication of repentance and what they had done and was baptized. He and all his, meaning his house, his servants that connected with him. And they did it at the next baptismal service, which is about eight days later. That's when we could get a lot of people in the church and we'll go baptize them. When did he do it? Immediately. Because why? Well, that, that's when I'm saved, <laughs> when, I, when I have my sins washed away. And he brought them up into his house. He set food before them, rejoiced greatly with all his house, having believed in God. It wasn't earning something, but I tell you, he did something. He had something done to him based upon his faith. 
And it's after baptism that he could rejoice having what? Believed. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that disbelieveth shall be condemned. We didn't say not be baptized. Why would you be baptized if you didn't believe? So Jesus didn't have to say that. How would he go to the territory? He that disbelieveth, what did he do? I believe the gospel. And I am now rejoicing because now at this point, I've been raised from the dead of my sins. Walking because of Christ's blood, because of his resurrection. And I rejoiced having believed in God. That is a, that's a powerful, you have, you have baptism immediately taking place when you hear the gospel. Why is that? You have the word being preached when it said, just believe. Uh, and none of it is earning anything, but God uses his power to bring about that message. And everyone is saved the same way. They have different experiences, but they're saved the same way. So those are passages, Mark 16, Acts 2, 38, Acts 8, Acts 16, that people rejoice after being baptized, and they say rejoice in having believed in God. And also the fact that when they do speak about things, believe and be baptized, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, it's pointing toward. So we'll, we'll come back and visit that uh, in question number six. Any questions or comments you might have? All right, look, look at question number three. How do you answer a person who accuses you of believing in water salvation if you believe that baptism saves us? So you got the water, and that was the element that we're, we're to be baptized in. And it's pretty prevalent throughout the world where there's people living. Wouldn't that follow? We can find the water. And, but I think you, that you, you believe in water salvation. And I, that's, just, that's just not right. How can you show it's not water salvation, but let's say it's blood salvation. Would you agree with that? Without the shedding of Christ's blood, without blood of Christ, we couldn't be saved. Wonder if I say what the blood does, baptism does. Would that be a powerful point to you? Well, blood does something and baptism does something. No, it does the same thing. Well, it might be that they might be connected somehow. Now, right, you can write these down underneath this, but let's look at what the blood does. In Revelation, the first chapter, and in verse, verse 10, we're opening up this wonderful book establishing the glory of, of the Lord. And at verse 10, says, he was in the spirit of the Lord's day, and I heard I mean, great voices of, of a trumpet. So he's, he sees this image, but notice in the first uh, few verses, and let's notice about verse 4. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace, from him who is and who was and who is to come. There's the eternal nature of, of the Lord Jesus. From the seven spirits that are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, unto him who loveth us and loosed us from our sins by his what? By his blood. Loose there, some of your footnotes will have wash. Well, didn't we just look at a passage a while ago to start where baptism was connected with washing away your sins? I could put Acts twenty two sixteen 16 there and say, it's not the water that saves me, but when I'm baptized, I get the benefits of Jesus' shed blood, which saves me. It gives you a link there, and it's not, well, Baptism does this and, and the blood does that. No, both of them do what in, this pa in these passages? They wash away my sins. They loose me from my sins. Now you're thinking, well, that's kind of what he said. We're baptized into his what? His death. Because he was raised, we're able to raise to walk into his life. But we're talking about his death now. That's where he shed his blood. And they do the same thing. I wonder how. Because they do it when, they, when you're baptized. 
that's when he applies this, the blood. That's not the only place this happens. Let's turn to Hebrews 9, 14. In Hebrews 9, in verse 14, we're looking at the blood of Christ superior to the blood of bulls and goats. And in verse 14, he says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish unto God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So here he offered himself without blemish. Here he was giving the, the blood of, of Christ was shed in order to cleanse the conscience. And it says it cleanses your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. He died. There's shedding of his blood in death. It cleanses our conscience. What does baptism do? Well, 1 Peter 3, 21 not only does it say that we're saved in the likeness where people were saved through water, we're saved through water, but what's it based, up, what, what's it based upon? And what does it do? He it says it's not putting away the filth of the flesh, but it's an answer of what kind of conscience? A good conscience. I'm appealing to the Lord and His death and resurrection for a Good conscience. What is a good conscience? It's got a clean conscience. I'm taking the guilt away. And he has, through his death, has cleansed me from an evil conscience. And he cleansed that. But he does that what? Through his death, through the shedding of his blood. That's not the only place. Turn with me to Matthew, the 26th chapter. Matthew 26 and verse 20, 28. We take the Lord's Supper. How often do we do that? Well, first day of the week when we come together. And this is what, what we do. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many unto, some pastors may say for, unto or for, the, for remission of sins. So when we partake of the fruit of the vine, which is representing his shed blood, he gave his life, shedding of his blood occurred on that, on that occasion. It's poured out for many. What's it pointing toward? Shedding of his blood is pointing toward what? Unto or for the remission of sins. Well, Acts, David, I'll get right there. Acts 2.38, what does it say? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord, for the remission of sins. So, I have, uh, past, I have the sins washed away by his blood. I have a guilty conscience cleansed by his blood. I have the remission of sins that, are, that are, uh, have, have that blessing because of his blood. But when does that blood, when is it applied? Every one of those, a clean conscience, remission of sins, having my sins washed away as I call upon the authority of the Lord? Happens when? It's baptism, isn't it? And so that takes away, it's not the water that's magical, that water saves you. But it is indeed understanding that it's the blood of Christ shed you. But that's, that was God's plan. He picks an element that, that is going to be plentiful. There are people, I wonder if you're on a desert. And it's interesting, the wilderness of, of the Union, going back to, to Ethiopia, they found water, didn't they, as they traveled? Here's water. And yet we, we find a lot of people want to balk at Well, God picked that. Let's say, let's say, all right, I like that blood thing, and I think we're going to start baptizing people in grape juice. Well, this might be a bad time to do it because... I can tell you, grape juice is probably going to count a lot and be very expensive in that thing. Have you tested that lately? So, we, but we're going to do that. What well, cause why? Because that's, that represents his blood. It doesn't matter. So we could save people from uh, their sins, but baptize them in, in, in grape juice, and we could make a big, a, a big deal over that. And we could do a, do a lot of things we, we work on, but that's what he commanded to do. 
And here, here's water, here's the element. When we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, when Christians were baptized, they were overwhelmed in the power of the Holy Spirit. But we have the power of God saving us when we're baptized in water for the mission of our sins. Cornelius and his household had already received the Holy Spirit to do to speak miraculously. But he said, you know, here's the, here's the water. Anybody going to refuse the water that these should not be baptized like we were? Why do that? They already had the Holy Spirit. And there, people argue with that, that. See, that means they're saved. No, it didn't mean they're saved. It means they had the opportunity to now repent and unto life. Let Peter tell you that in Acts 11. But the point is, is that here was when that occurs, that indeed it's water, it's baptism in the name of the Lord, it's water baptism. And all those things can come together. And I think you could bring that to people's attention to help them to at least see that. They may not believe that. And they may not see the need of that. But to me, that has helped take some barriers away that we're, we're looking at. Back in the early 1800s, Alexander Campbell debated a man in dealing with infant baptism. And one of the arguments that that to, as well as his first, uh, I think it was with Walker, is the first time he debated. And so how are you going to deal with, well, infant baptism is like circumcision. It's New Testament things about like circumcision. So you're circumcised on what day? Right. Jews, eighth day. We, well, we circumcise, maybe it's on the eighth day. I don't know exactly when they do that. But that, that, that we're baptized and we're babies. We're going to baptize. It's taking the place of Old Testament circumcision. And circumcision was a sign of the relationship with God. Baptism is a sign of our relationship with God. It doesn't save us. It's not what saves us. And I can, and the point is, and it does with, with that particular baby because they want to save the babies. Because why are the babies going to heaven? Not in their doctrine. Catholics say we've got we to gotta have baptism because they're going to die in their sins. They had original sin, which was error. But that's, that, that's how things go. You get an error, you're going to accommodate it, and, it, and it, then the error just keeps on repeating itself generation after generation. And how, how's that going to be solved? We get back to the original. That's what, that's what these uh, men like Campbell were trying to do. So you had to deal with that. Do you have circumcision connected with baptism in the New Testament? Yes, you do. Turn with me to, to Colossians. Turn with me to Colossians 2. This is in the book. You can go back or in the booklet here and look at it. But notice there's a circumcision that takes place in baptism, but it's not made with hands. And it's what Jesus does. And we see that in these verses 11 and 12. In whom ye were also circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands. Why is he saying that? Because it's not circumcision of the Old Testament. That was with hands. That was taking away the, the flesh. And now we're putting away the sins. There's, there's, there's the parallel to that. Not that they're infants. But he says, they're putting off of the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. So there is circumcision. It's, it's, it's metaphorically expressing our sins are taken away. The foreskin was taken away in circumcision. It's taken away, but it's not made with hands. It's something that God does. And we know he sprinkles the heart with the blood of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, wherein you also were raised with him. Through faith in the working of God, he raised him from the dead. Does baptism have faith connected with it? I think that's a great thing to bring to people's attention. It's not faith versus baptism. I'm saved at the point of faith only, and I just believe in, in God, and, and baptism is, uh, is, is not essential to that. But they, again, they work together. And when James talks about faith and works, Paul will talk about them going against it because they're works of the law. But in James, faith is, is there and it is expressed in our obedience. It's expressed in works. When we're baptized, we're using our faith that Jesus not only died for my sins, I'm baptized into his death and the benefits of his death, his blood, 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 and I'm being baptized into his death, and, but the resurrection. And even Paul does that. We're raised to walk in newness of life. Without the resurrection, we're still in our sins. We're men most pitiable, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. So those two things had to come in, into play. There is circumcision 
in that. There's faith connected with that. And we are, we're set apart from the, uh, from the world of sin at the, at the point of baptism. But the idea that, well, circumcision, eight day old children, we can baptize because circumcision is taking away sins and that's what baptism did so we could do it for infants. So then you have to deal with that. No, you don't find anybody being baptized unless you assume households were just children. A lot of times they were servants. But he preached the gospel to, to, the, to the jailer and his household. Little babies, can they hear and believe? Well, I don't know, that's a pretty intelligent little kid, you know. And I'll read to him my Bible all the time. What, is he picking up on it? Probably not. You may, you may kind of attract his attention for a while, but he's not death of Jesus. And the point is that babies don't, we talk about, I, I talked to a man the other day and, and he used the term accountable and he said the church is mad at him. They don't like him using age of accountability. You know, what were, you know, when is that? I think it's because it's kind of hard to define which it is. Different kids are in different places. They don't like it. They don't like it. But I understand what he's saying and I think we, we have a passage that says, you know, this, this is a concept that's in our Bible. Turn, turn me to Romans, the seventh chapter. Paul is describing himself, and, he's, and he said, well, I want to do this, but I don't do it. And he said, well, he's schizophrenic. No, he's not. He's, he's describing himself as a Jewish man under the law of Moses. And he has a desire to do that, which is good, but reality, he doesn't. He doesn't keep all the law all the time. And so he, he, he comes up and said, I, I give in to that. I am man most pitiable. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? And uh, it's going to be Jesus Christ. Romans 8, there's no condemnation in Christ. So, but he's describing himself. But notice what he says here. Verse 9, I was alive apart from the law once. But when the commandments came, sin revived and I died. When could Paul ever been alive apart from the law? When was the law given? When was Paul born? <laughs> Way after the law of Moses, right? He'd be born and as a Jew, he'd be circumcised. He'd, he'd be, you know, he'd, he'd, the law came along before that. I was alive apart from the law once. How could that be? It's when you're a child and you're not at an age of accountability where you are condemned in your sin. But he says, here I was. I'm saying he's innocent of sin. Children are innocent. They don't have to be baptized as infants to go to heaven. That's what, it's just like they said, we got to sprinkle because they're, they, they can't, they're, they, they're in the hospital. They can't, they can't be immersed. They change things, that's man's ways. But what is, Paul is saying here, there's a time when they're safe. They don't need to be saved. They're safe. The horrors of young children in Ubaldi, I think about the age, you know, sometimes when people, are, when the hormones and the bodies are changing, that becomes, a, I, I obeyed the gospel at 12. <laughs> My dad wouldn't baptize me when I came forward because it surprised him. I was, see, I'm too young. I didn't know what it was, but I've been listening to him preach. He must not think much of that <laughs> all this time, but it surprised him. He wanted to make sure. So I had a big old congregation. I had to come back Sunday. I came back Sunday night. And he had to baptize me. But we had a discussion. It just, I just floored him going a little bit earlier than I should. But he, but he, was, he was confident. I knew, knew what I was doing. But there, there's a sense of coming of, of age. I realize now I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm accountable for what I'm doing. I know I'm a sinner. And Star Telegram has said that there's a planet coming and destroying our world. And I said, I better get it done now. I didn't want to go to hell either. And I found out later they miss us by thousands of miles <laughs> as I've grown up. So don't worry about it. But it, it said, hey, this is very important. And my conscience bothered me. And 
we, we got it done. So, but there's, there's a sense that until then, our children are, are safe. So these young children, this, say, you know, one of the third, fourth grade, it's tragic that, that, I mean, God's in control. He allows things to happen. But what about those children? One of the things I could give comfort if that happened to my child is that, they're, they're, especially young ones, they're safe. They're not going to miss heaven. And I just want, I just want to be there with them. Or in, in, a, in a spiritual, how that's going to be a coming. I know husband and wife and children, that's right, but they're safe. And that would, that would bring a, a comfort because it didn't change. Just like James' mother could be comforted because James is killed. She still got John, but James is, is killed. But Peter's saved. Same situation. They're going to go get Peter now. They, they beheaded my son. They're going to get Peter and he and God delivers him. So you can go crazy. Think about God's will and all that. God's in control. But one of the blessings is that James and Peter and they didn't miss out on what's important. Did they? They're all they're going to heaven. And that's what we got to focus on. That's something that we have that the world doesn't have. We have that confidence, hope, but a child is safe. I was alive apart from the law once, but then sin, sin revived when the commandment came. <laughs> well, it, it's already been here. It came to my conscience. And it's a part of the conscience. That's why that conscience is cleansed. And so that, that takes place. But Infant baptism, uh, that's uh, something people do. They don't even think about it. But if you never, you want to find somebody, that, here's the gospel so they can respond to that, respond to that gospel. Okay. What saving relationship does baptism bring us into? We'll just hit on this. Galatians 3, 26, 27, we're baptized into Christ, aren't we? We're sons of God by faith being baptized. So faith and baptism working together here. But we're baptized into Christ. There's a saving relationship. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, we're baptized into one body. In the sense that we are ushered in baptism and God adds us to his body, there is indeed where you find the saved. We have to remain saved. But there's a relationship of the one body, one Christ, uh, that we are in a saved relationship and he places us in his church. The time we have here. Discuss the arguments that are proposed to show that baptism is not necessary for salvation. Let me give you one that uh, uh, modern Calvinists give that maybe you haven't dealt with. Acts 2.38. Repent ye, it says, every, you know, repent ye and be baptized for the remission of your sins. When you look at the Greek language, repent is plural. Remission of sins is plural. So what would they connect together? Repentance is plural. And forgiveness of sins are plural. But baptism is singular. Now, there, if you get an argument with a theologian, especially Calvinist, they're going, they're going to use it. And sometimes people will uh, use that as, as well. So, you, so baptism is singular. And they say, well, what difference does that make? It makes a lot of difference. Because it says that repentance was necessary. Repent ye. Everybody needs to re repent thee. And so you can all be baptized. So you can have the remission of sins. Repentance is connect remission of sins. But baptism is singular. And therefore, it's not something, it's something you do, but it's not necessary for the remission of sins because it, it wasn't plural. Now, I gave on page three, uh, I think this is a false assumption, and I'll give this what it's worth. We could say, assemble ye, there's plural, and be vaccinated, every one of you, singular, in the name of the state to eliminate your COVID diseases. Eliminate your diseases. Plural. Well, we think that since the command to assemble and eliminate diseases, diseases were plural. And they worked together, but vaccination didn't. 
Just because you assembled and had your diseases taken away, what was essential to having that happen? Every one of you needs to be vaccinated. I'm speaking to a group. It will take away your diseases, but what is also essential? It's singular. Every one of you be baptized. Repent ye, and we can apply, well, that means everybody. But see, that's what's connected with, with, with sin, remission of sins, and uh, baptism is singular. Well, that's something that works for me. Because you know, vaccination will have to be there. Yes, Corey? Well, in every one of you, it had to be singular. So, why, yeah, why are they being that's right. So, but that's one they they have. What, another one that we use Matthew twenty six. There, there being Jesus shed his blood for the remission of sins. Was was G, was our sins washed away uh, without the blood? No. Is it because? And we use the word because of because he says, well, you you repent, be baptized for the remission of your sins, for the remission of sin, but because of your sins have been removed. That's why you get baptized. It's just a picture of what's already happened. What is that about the blood? Was the blood of Christ shed because we've already had the remission of sins? It doesn't work, does it? It was always pointing toward. Now let me give you one. Before they come. Matthew 12 will be one. They, they repented at the preaching of Jonah. That word is ace. That word is for. And we would be easy to say, they repented because of the preaching of Jonah. That's one they'll use. But the point is, they didn't preach, they didn't repent because he was preaching. They, rep they repented toward his preaching. What was he preaching? Repentance. They are indeed repenting toward the teaching. That's what it was. Not because of, it's toward. Ace is always pointing toward something. And that's, and, that, and that becomes very important. He's pointing toward, I'm, I'm repenting toward the preaching. That's what he's demanding of me. And uh, I'm giving a gift uh, because they are a, a child of God. I give a drink of water because they're, they're, they're followers. It, it's because I'm pointing to them being followers. It's, but they'll use the word because of. And we don't have a lot of time, but that, there'll be something that you might think about when uh, people use that argument. Any, any things you want to sum up real quickly? Oh, I want to be a Christian, tell me how. Oh, I want to be a Christian, tell me how. If you want to be a Christian, then you must pay attention. Oh, I want to be a Christian, tell me how. You must hear God's word. You must hear God's word and believe the words you hear. Repent the Lord the Son, then confess that He's our Son. Be baptized and God will add you to His church. Live faithfully and do the things you should. Live faithfully and do the things you should. Read, study, and obey. There is no other way. Live faithfully and do the things you should.